up, everyone? Welcome to the Copy Blogger Podcast. My name is Tim Stoddart. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, I am with my friend and my co-host, Ethan Brooks. What's up, Ethan? What's going on, man? Happy Friday. I feel like I say that every week. Need yeah, to and it's like every better. time I do this, I think to myself, is it better to just have like a consistent opening that people expect and you just get through it, you know, and then you can just move on as opposed to some long-winded yeah like meandering uh Full so I'm, I'm sticking with it especially because i memorized it at this point so i couldn't even change it if i wanted to all right i want to just jump right into this one because i am so excited about what i found over the week and i think you are going to be excited too so you know as does everybody who listens to this that i have never been a fan slash advocate of selling advertisement in blogs or even podcasts or in newsletters, right? Well, I found something over the last week that might have completely changed my mind. And the way that the guy who we're doing the case study on today has put it together is so freaking simple that over the last couple of days, I've been reevaluating this whole thing in my mind because it's like, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I think of that? Right? And I've been especially thinking about how when in the last episode, you talked about the hustle and you talked about the revenue numbers, like, yeah, we do like a couple million a year. I'm like, yeah, well, you guys have a million subscribers, right? And now I want to say in front of everybody that I take it back. Um, (laughs) Like, (laughs) I I am more gung-ho on ads and sponsorships than I think I've ever been in my entire like entrepreneurial career. And here's why. So before I even go any further, the look on your face is 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 pretty funny hearing me say this. It's going through your head right now. Well, yeah, this is a big change, man. It sounds like you found something uh something big. And uh it's like anytime I hear somebody say that their chain their thinking has changed this dramatically on something, yeah. I'm always curious to hear more. So take me through. What'd you get? You are probably going to have a better experience if you listen to the if you watch the video on this one because we're going to do a lot of screen sharing and Ethan and I have been talking I think we're going to do a whole lot of screen sharing from this point forward we're going to treat our podcast almost like a uh, an exercise in learning and sort of teaching each other live on the screen so if you want to watch the video go to YouTube just type in copy blogger podcast you'll find it right away okay so he- here's the newsletter it's called for the interested it's by Josh Spector, I believe his name is. You ever hear of Josh? I've heard of For the Interested, but I don't think I had connected the, the newsletter with the name. Okay. Well, let me find his name real quick so that I know I'm, I'm saying his name right. He and I have been chatting back and forth on Twitter. I actually bought a sponsorship from him on his newsletter because I wanted to test it out. Let me make sure I got it. Josh Spector. Yeah, I got it right. Sorry, Josh. He and I have been talking all week. And now that I'm live on the air, I'm like forgetting what his last name is. Okay. So his newsletter is, or his brand is called For the Interested. You can find it at fortheinterested.com. It is so simple what he does that it totally flipped everything that I thought when it came to monetizing through ads. So I had, I, I reached out to him. And I asked him a few questions through email, and it was really, really cool. He uh, he actually said that I can read this out loud. So I sent him a few questions. I said, how did you grow your list? How did you experiment with sponsorships? How much revenue? And where are you planning to go? He sent me back so much information. I'm not going to read all of wow, it. Wow, this looks it great. Be, yeah, it could be a legitimate blog post and, and like a case study within itself. But I, I will read some of it. So here we go. I launched For the Interested in 2016 as a weekly newsletter and have published every Sunday since. First off, like most important part right there. He hasn't missed a single Sunday since 2016. And how many times do we talk about that, right? About a year, I expanded into a one paragraph weekday edition as well. So his newsletter is technically twice a week. It's like a full scale, long form newsletter on Sunday and then a really short form paragraph on Wednesday, which will be important. Uh, he then kind of... Can I pause you for just one second uh, to give people a little bit of context? So just on the timing for this, 2016, obviously six years ago, was really before newsletters were like a proven business model. So I think we'll probably end up talking about this again in a minute, but uh, you mentioned the consistency, which was a huge point. 
it's also important to note he was doing this before it was common to go build a newsletter business. Yeah. And also, he wasn't building a newsletter business at this point. Uh, he talks even more about how he, he didn't realize what he had until recently, once he combined it all and just decided to take it seriously. Uh, so then he, he then goes on to say that he had a couple other projects he was working on. He basically combined them all into the one brand, which is for the interested. He said he lost a couple thousand subscribers when he did that, but he knew that it was the best way to go. All right. My audience. So combined, I had about 7,000 subs, though I'd guess about half or so eventually bailed because for the interested, it was obviously a bit different than those other newsletters. So I probably started with around 4K subs after the dust settled. My audience primarily grew from a few different things. I published at least one blog post a week for years and promoted the newsletter in it. Great. That's what I do. Love to hear it. I also cross-posted each post to Medium and built an audience there, which converted into newsletter subscribers. That's cool. I've seen people have success on Medium. I, I don't personally like Medium. I, I think it hurts SEO. I don't have any proof of that other than my own like confusion on how some of these links from Medium don't seem to be working well. But anyway, he used Medium and, and that's cool. I ran fo- Facebook ads in the early days, created a, a Facebook group for newsletter creators, I was active on Twitter. He's grown his audience to 20,000 followers. He did cross promotions and was interviewed on podcasts. So so basically, he just he got himself out there, which is what we talk about all the time. He just got in front of people, didn't necessarily know the best way to go about doing it, but he did what seems like a little bit of everything. And eventually, he's landed into a weekly blog post and really active on Twitter. And I think he gets on podcasts whenever he can. And it, uh, it says here, the last line of that section is the newsletter is up to 18,000. So 14,000 new subscribers over the last few years, primarily through what you said, just kind of getting out there, getting after it and being visible online. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the, the 18,000 subs is actually the part that has excited me the most, because when I tell you how he's monetizing this thing, like 18,000 subs isn't a small amount, but it's not a huge amount either. You know, like I yeah. really think anybody listening to this can get 20,000 subscribers on a newsletter, especially if they do it the way he's doing it, which is what's so cool. All right. So question two, I asked him, how did you experiment with sponsorships? He's got a lot of information here, but this is what's so cool. He said, for the first several years, I had no ads in my newsletter and was actively against them because I thought I annoy readers. <laughs> I was like, fuck. When I read that, I was like, God damn it. That's so <laughs> annoying. But one day a subscriber reached out to me and she said she was a therapist who helped creative people. She had run a classified ad in Ann Friedman's newsletter and got great results, the best of any marketing she's done. Uh, okay. So he goes on to say that he started questioning if maybe ads were viable. He did a poll. People said that they don't get annoyed by ads as long as they're relevant because a lot of times it's really on topic with what they follow the newsletter for in the first place. And all right, so here we go. At the time, my newsletter was only weekly. So I offered five ad slots in each Sunday issue. I sold out the first several weeks and basically sold out ever since. Once I launched the weekday editions, I launched one ad spot in each weekday edition. So now people who buy an ad get a Sunday mention and then the loan sponsor on the weekday edition the following week. They write copy for the Sunday ad. I write copy for the, for the weekday ad. Currently, sponsors average about 250 clicks on their ads. Wow. Yeah. So two things here that stood out to me. One, I can probably find an example of his newsletter. But when I think of ads on newsletters, I genuinely think that they need to be very robust. The Hustle does a great job of this, where the ad itself is kind of like a story, right? They write the copy so that it fits within the context of the newsletter. Josh is like, nah, (laughs) like here's a link. And so now he has five ad slots in every newsletter. So, I mean, the data has got to back it up. Obviously, just adding links isn't necessarily going to generate results, but it seems like he's built a consistent culture in his ads that people know that these links are sponsorships and they look at the brief copy before the links and if they click them, great. So five ad slots per newsletter and then one ad slot per the Wednesday newsletter. 
Okay, this part I really, really loved, right? When I launched the ads, I purposely priced them low. This is so cool. I wanted them to sell out and be perceived as a hot product. I knew I could always raise the price down the road, and that's what I've done. I started out at 50 bucks an ad, and then went to 65, then 80, then 100, and then 200 a couple months ago. They've continued to sell out way in advance. I'm currently sold out until the end of May. Because I offer five ads a week at $200, it's currently $1,000 a week and 4K a month business, assuming they continue to sell out at the new $200 rate. All right. A few things to go through here. The fact that he started selling the ads so low really, really stood out to me because one of the reasons why I've always been so apprehensive to get into the ad business is because the work of managing ads is just as labor intensive as the work of managing a product or a service that you could just sell on your own. So to me, it was always like it cancels each other out because you don't get any ease by by managing ads. Like in, in fact, ads are hard, right? Like all the relationships and then some people pay you here and then some people don't get you the copy in time, right? But this brings me to, I'm going to stay here for a little bit, but when I see uh, the last question, Q4, and how he's actually processing these ads, this is the real game changer for me. But anyway, he's starting at 50 bucks an ad, and then went to 65, and then went to 80, and he created a real perceived promise of value. And what I immediately thought of is a, a book I read some time ago when I was doing my t-shirt company called Girl Boss of... Uh, Sophia Amoroso, she was the founder of, ah, shit, what was it called? Um, Nasty Gal. It was a clothing company. And she got her start by thrifting and selling clothes on eBay. And she was just one of the first people to realize that the tiny, tiny little thumbnail image that you have on eBay is actually where the sale is made. So she talked a lot about how this perceived value is like even more important than the product itself because it was just thrifting. She was going to thrift stores in her neighborhood. I think she grew up in California and just buying dresses and boots and whatever and putting outfits together and you know maybe stitching up some clothes here and there. But she she just had a white light moment when she realized that that one little tiny featured image is where the perceived value comes along. And so Josh understood that as well. He said instead of making money what I need to do is I need to ramp up my perceived value. And then what? All of a sudden, people are getting emails every week with the ad slots completely stacked out. And you're thinking, oh, damn, Like this guy really must be doing something. This is generating revenue for the advertisers. This is every single week, there's five ad slots completely sold out. Like, wow, what an what a amazing product. The perceived value is telling me an amazing product. And like, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because the perceived value makes everybody continue to take it seriously, which makes it more serious. All right. Last question. Question four. Where are you planning to go? The vast majority of ad clicks come from the weekday editions. At some point, I may need to scrap the Sunday ads and create a new Sunday ad product, maybe a single sponsor for that issue at a higher price point and more premium featured placement. I agree, by the way. I do think that when people read long form newsletters, having just a bunch of links seems out of place. And people are used to the idea of the ad being part of the story, right? And being like more polished. So I, I, I agree with that. I also think my ads are underpriced, which I also agree with. So it's likely I'll raise the prices again in a couple months. I'm also going to launch a podcast soon, which will create another sponsorship opportunity. Cool. And of course, my newsletter hopefully grows, which I'm sure it will. The ads will continue to increase in value. So here's the real kicker. And this is the part that was so stupidly simple when I saw it and completely changed the way that I think about it. So what he did is he created an e-commerce store, basically, just to sell his ads. So any huh. like when I reached out to him, because uh, we were doing a swap, and then I was like, oh, well, I don't have that many subscribers. This doesn't make sense. I'll just buy an ad. And I'm thinking there's going to be a call, maybe like an assistant, going to have to go over what my tone and what my message is. So I was like, not really. I just want to link on your newsletter to try to get people to my Tim Stodd site. And that's all he provided. He just sent me a link with this page. 
And then he sent me a link where buy your sponsorship here. And so he just real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Real quick. Let me just, for anybody who is not watching the video, the last page that Tim was just referencing is basically just a long text page, maybe two, three, three, 400 words a copy. Yeah. And it's all about sponsorship opportunities. You scroll down. It's talking about what, what am I saying here? So here's what you get as a sponsor. There's a couple of bullet points there. He's got some bullet points for your ad creative, which is really important because as Tim mentioned, uh, one of the keys for ad sales is just minimizing back and forth. So making sure that the client is going to send the proper images, text, et cetera, links all on time so you create the ad. And then there's basically a button that says reserve your sponsorship here. And that's what Tim just clicked. And that took us to, what is this, a Squarespace page? It's not even Squarespace. It's just square. It's just a POS. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And so... He just created an e-commerce store out of his ads because going back to the sales page, it's so simple. Ads are text only, no images or emojis and can include one link. I love it. I love that because it's actually funny in in the newsletter business. When people get into it, they think they have to make their newsletters really creative when it's text. like It's just images and text. Those are the most successful emails. You will supply the copy for the Sunday ad. I'll write the copy for the weekday ad, inspired by your by your own copy, but in my voice. All ads are subject to editorial approval. All right, cool. So when you click on this reserve your sponsorship here, and all you do is you buy these ads as though it's a product. So So we're we're looking at a big page full of this basically it almost looks like a calendar. And yeah, yeah. each well, think of like a normal e-commerce site where you'd come to a landing page, there's 20 like listings, maybe 20 different shirts. So all the listings kind of look roughly the same laid out in that uh, grid pattern. But instead of a different product image for each one, each one of these products is a date. And so we're looking at the week of July 24th, the week of July 31st, the week of August 7th, and just on and on out to what? It looks like maybe the middle of September, beginning of yeah. September. And everything is literally sold out until the end of August. (laughs) So what happens when you click one of these? How does it, what's the actual process look like for buying an ad? Well, I think at first I thought to myself, why use Square? Because why not just do it with Stripe? But here's what's so cool about it. Square is typically like an in-person POS. And, you know, there's a coffee shop down the street in East Nashville called Ugly Mugs and they use Square. And Mm -hmm. Square always has emails attached to it. And so I already had an account with Square, as most people listening do as well. You just don't know it. And so all I did was I click on it. So right now I'm on the week of July 31st. Uh, it's, it's the, w- w- we call this the product description because essentially I'm on a product page. Like I said, it's an e-commerce store more or less. And so the product description is, is the same thing. The product image is just a big image that says week of July 31st. And then I click on add to cart. And then when I click checkout, that's it. And like, I'm not going to fill out this information, but, uh, but once I put my email address in there, my, my credit card auto populated. <laughs> and so like, I just bought the ad without doing anything. So I love the simplicity. Um, and we got so much to talk about, but there's one more quick thing, which I want to go through. The part that he didn't mention in the questions and answers where he says right here that um, it's currently $1,000 a week and $4,000 a month business, assuming they continue to sell out at the $200 rate, which obviously they will because they sold out for weeks and weeks in advance. But he actually sends daily emails through an autoresponder. And every one of these daily emails has a sponsor. And each one of them is so simple. And I've, I like to observe my behavior here. I've opened every one and I've clicked on every single one. Hmm. And so I, I always thought newsletters need to be media centric and robust, right? This is the email that I got this morning. It's an email that says, most products and services make promises that are too big. Instead, see what happens if you promise smaller wins. And That's promise smaller email. wins is the anchor text. And all it does is lead to a tweet. This is it. It's just a, 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 a tweet with some good information. 
But then underneath it, today's email is sponsored by a service that will edit your blog post, newsletter, presentation, and other writing in 24 hours or less. Use code FTI to try it for free. And that's it. And I've gotten every one of these for the last 10 days. And I've opened every single one. So not only is he selling out, he turned his newsletter into an e-commerce store, but he turned his autoresponder into like a two-sentence email that generates simple clicks curates content basically through Twitter where he doesn't have to do anything. Like he doesn't have to write new blog posts and newsletters every time. He just finds something cool on Twitter and links out to it. And that's That's sponsors. brilliant. And brilliant, who right? is this sponsor? Edit Edit Tops? Edit Ops? Edit, edit Ops. Ops. Okay. Yeah. It's like that mad gab card game. Okay. Uh, I have a bunch of things I want to dig into related to this. This is really cool. And right. I got to say, you delivered like... Tim texted me the other night. He's like, I've got something really cool to talk about. <laughs> and I'm always, I'm always, because like, that's all he ever says. It's like, I've got something that's <laughs> awesome. And then it's just like, all right, what's it going to be? You delivered. This is cool. This is cool because I think this is a very unique way to solve the most difficult problem that it, uh, comes up in ad sales, which is how do you handle all the back and forth? How do you handle yeah. the logistics of ad sales without it becoming overwhelming as a solo creator? This is the first time I've ever seen this implemented at like this, like this, or even at this scale, right? Because yeah. he's doing this much at a much smaller size than most newsletters would. And I love it. I think this is awesome. I uh, agree with him. He's under probably undercharging, right? So yeah. just he, he clearly knows this too. He's because he said it. But just for our listeners, I want to emphasize that like, if you're not completely thrilled with the numbers you just heard, you can charge more than this as well. Like Certainly we talked can. last week about Alexis and how she's basically charging like thousands of dollars for a much smaller list. Really what it comes down to is, do you know how to monetize well? And um, I think some people, like everyone's going to have different opinions on what that is. It sounds like he's going through some experimentation and stuff, but I love this implementation. I think it's very cool. I love and it. yeah, let's break a couple things down. The first thing I want to get into though is, uh, sort of a meta idea, which is how can you talk people through how this exchange actually started? Because you asked four really interesting questions. And what strikes me is that this is exactly the kind of interaction that is like so valuable that a lot of people never have because they'll never ask these questions. And the people who do go through and do stuff like this benefit uh, like enormously from it. So how did you actually even get him to answer these questions? How'd that conversation start? Because I, I saw the first email. It was literally just four questions. There was like no prelude. So I'm assuming before you sent that, you were like, yo, can I send you some questions? How, yeah. what was I the I reached setup? out to him on Twitter. I'm looking at it right now. I just sent him a DM on Twitter. Yep. And um, what'd you say? I said, what's up, Josh? You and I haven't spoken directly yet. We've, he knows who I am. I know who he is. We've uh, right. yeah. gone back and forth. Now that I've seen his face, I, I recognize him from Twitter too. I don't, I, I hadn't uh, remembered his name, but he tweets a lot about how to build newsletters as well. Uh, yeah, he certainly does. And so he sent me his website. He said, hey, Tim, I do, and they work really well. I'm biased, but it's true. You can read about them and book them here. What are you looking to promote? And, and I was a little bit confused at first because he just sent me the sales page. So I, I suppose if there is one critique, his CTA, on the sales page that actually goes to, and this is the copywriter in me, because the fact that I couldn't see exactly where to buy the sponsorship mm. instantly um, confused me. And he said, what are you looking to promote? And I said, my newsletter, it doesn't say the price, which right there as a copywriter, I'm looking at and I'm thinking I didn't deliver my message clearly. And that's when he sent me the link to his Square site, which is basically his e-commerce store. And that was when I just, I went down the rabbit hole on it. I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. So you're just trying to get me to give you my credit card to buy an ad on your newsletter. And so then, you know, there's a couple of days of going back and forth just because I was so freaked out by this. And uh, I asked if I could ask him some questions and talk about it on the podcast. And of course you said yes. So that's, that's, I think, the message right there that I would love to just key in on because this is such an important skill for people to develop, this skill of like asking other people who have built the business that you want to build for their insight. And I think 
it's something a lot of people struggle with. I've struggled with it in the past. There's a temptation to feel like you know what you're doing or to to try and act like you know what you're doing. And then a lot of people just won't ever ask for yeah. insight. So what is, you just said, what, can you just read, like, what did you actually say when you said, can I ask you some questions? How is that email structured or how's that note written? Um, I said, I have a question. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Maybe I'm just like overly blunt or something. I said, I have a question. Can Ethan and I use you as a case study in the next episode of the podcast? And I said, what do you want to talk about? And do you want me to come on? I said, no, we've decided we're not doing guests, but each week we're doing a case study. As I've been getting your emails, I've been so impressed and have so many questions. I love, I love how you sneak sponsorship links in there, meaning the daily quick one-liner emails. It's so simple and effective. Can you just give me the one, two, three? And he said, sure. Email me whatever questions you have to... Uh, I'm not going to give out his email address. Yep. And I'll send over some answers. And I said, this is amazing. Thank you so much. I'm buying an ad from you now. Okay. I want to point out a couple of things for people real quick and then um, dig into some of the logistics around the ad sales process as well, because I think we can we can go even deeper here. Okay. A couple of things Tim did great in that outreach that people should keep in mind if they're trying to reach out to other people who are like busy and running exciting businesses. First, he offered value on two different levels, right? So first he said, can I talk about you on my podcast? Which, mm. you know, as long as the person you're reaching out to has reason to believe that you're not going to like smear them on the podcast, that's a valuable proposition. You're basically saying, can I help spread the word about your work? Awesome. The other thing he did was he like, you know, he said, oh, this is great. I'm going to buy an ad from you too. Not that you need to pay for advice all the time, but if you're trying to stand out, especially for busy people, one great way to do this is to just kind of think about like what's going to help them a little bit in doing what they want. So one thing I learned this from our uh, podcast producer here at The Hustle, he's got a great, before he came here, he used to run an agency that was specifically focused on how to book guests on podcasts and they like major podcasts. And one um, thing that they would always do is they would, if, when they were doing outreach, uh, like say they had an author who just wrote a new book or something and you and wanted to get them a spot on the podcast, they had the author reach out to the podcast creator and say, hey, so-and-so like loved your podcast, like maybe just listened to the episode about blah, 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 and like left you guys a five-star review over on Apple, I, iTunes, whatever. There's a quick compliment. And then you're providing value up front by doing something that you know they're trying hard to develop for podcast reviews. hosts. Reviews. Yeah. yeah. And obviously you want to be honest because like if you just give everybody great reviews and all of a sudden like your review doesn't matter anymore, that's sort of shitty. It's it's not going to carry a lot of weight. But the big idea there is if you're going to reach out, you can stand out by figuring out ways to provide value for the person that you're reaching out to. The second thing is he kept it very short. Can you just give me the one, two, three? Not asking for his time. I don't want to pick your brain. I don't want you to come onto the podcast. Like for as cool as those opportunities are for people, everyone's just too busy for a lot of that. So starting with these couple of questions is way better. And then the last thing that I just love about this is that you asked in the first place. I was just listening to Sam's podcast this morning and he was talking about, he's doing this right now for everybody who may not be familiar, Sam Parr, founder of The Hustle. Really unique guy. I think he's one of his superpowers is kind of like surrounding himself with people who uh, know a certain business better than he does, and they'll teach him everything they know. And then he goes off and he starts it, and he does really well. Right now, he's specifically spending his time reaching out to bankers, asking them about different acquisitions that they worked on in a specific field where he wants to start a business. So rather than being like, like let's say you wanted to start a media company, rather than just going out and reading everybody who's telling you how to start a media company. Uh, go talk to people who've sold media businesses and and ask them like why did this acquisition work? Like what almost didn't work? What would you like? What do you wish the founder had done different? All these other questions that he had, he's just going straight to the source. Like in this case, the person who's eventually going to sell your company and asking for their advice. So th this is really useful, and I think the way that you did this is is cool. Let's talk about ad inventory and then his process for sales. So he talked about this in a couple different ways. For the people who are listening, there are three different types of ad inventories that you can include in a newsletter. And I think it's not always obvious what those are, but I'm happy to talk through them because if if we talk through them real quick, 
I think is going to make this business model a little bit more transparent to people. And I can also kind of show people how they're priced and how they work together in order to maximize income. Do you want to go through that? I want to hear about this. Yeah. I'm okay, all cool. in on this. Um, I need screen share. Sure. All right. So I'm going to talk through this in case you're not watching the video, but if you do have a chance to go through and check out the video, you're going to get a pretty cool insight here. So let me share my screen. Okay. For background, at the hustle a couple of years ago, or not a couple of years ago, I guess a year and a half ago, we did this big deep dive on the newsletter business. Obviously, we've been running a successful newsletter for years, but we found that a lot of people were interested in that. And so we were going to put together this big in-depth guide on how the business works. So I spent maybe six months interviewing people all the way across the industry, really breaking down how the business model works. And one of the things we looked at was ads in particular. And what I found was that there are traditionally three different types of ad inventory. And at the high level, they are a premium ad, a downsell, and then a loss leader. And I'll explain what each is and how they work together in a second. But the reason I think this is important to talk through is that if you're not aware that these are out there, a lot of times your ad strategy can just be sort of like shoot from the hip, right? You uh -huh. create uh, a kind of random number of ads, um, not sure where to price them, not sure when to grow inventory and how these things kind of operate in order to grow your business. So here is the high level breakdown. You can start and run a very successful multi-million dollar newsletter with just one ad spot. Uh, in fact, the hustle grew to $2 million plus in annual revenue with just one ad spot. And what you're really leaning on there is the size of your audience. So, and your like ability to monetize at a high level. When you increase ad inventory, you are basically doing that for a couple of reasons. One, it can it can increase revenue, right? It can also allow you to sell to other clients who couldn't uh. afford your primary ad spot. And so this is how these three different types of ads work together. There's your premium, your downsell, and your loss leader. The premium is the biggest, most expensive ad. The price on that ideally never changes. It's big, it's expensive. And even if somebody can't afford it, when you come into a conversation about selling ads, you always lead with the premium ad because it sort of anchors their mindset at this high price point. And that's where you generate value for the like the perceived value of your of your advertising. Similar to what he was talking about in terms of like making his ads look like they're valuable because they're always filled. Yeah. That's one way to do it. Another way is like in the individual conversation, you need to come in the door and be like, this is expensive. Are you sure you want to advertise here? Now, some people are going to jump on that. They're going to say, Sounds great because advertising is expensive and sometimes your number is just going to fit right into their budget. Other times they'll be like, I don't know if I can fit that. And that's where the downsell comes in. So you have a less expensive ad that you can typically offer to get them in the door. And then finally, there's the loss leader. And I'm going to go through an example of this, a visual example of this as well. So people can see what this typically looks like in practice. But the loss leader is incredibly inexpensive usually very light lift for your ad team to create. And the idea there is twofold. It can be a very low cost test, right? So if you say, hey, I get it two grand or whatever, it's too expensive right now. We also have this smaller ad, the loss leader. It's whatever, 150 bucks. Give it a test, see if it works, right? Or Instead of a test, you can use the loss leader. You can stack it on top of one of your other two ads in order to add value there for free. So like free. you could say, yeah, hey, okay, well, I get 2000 Like maybe that seems like it's right on the edge of your budget. I'll tell you what, I'll throw in two of these other mentions for free because it's such a light lift for your company. It's You're really not going to be put out by doing that. Am I making sense by aligning these three up in that way? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Okay, so that's how they work. Premium downsell loss leader. And again, you can build a whole huge newsletter business, you know, several million dollars on just one ad spot. It's possible. Um, but there are strategic reasons for diversifying. Now, let's look at how this works in practice. So what I have here, I'm scrolling for people listening. I'm scrolling through this book that we wrote. And we're actually going to release this soon, too. It's like we're going through like a, a final edit round on it. But we're looking at a screenshot of the ad rate card from the Morning Brew. Uh, and I think this is from oh, this is Q3 2020. So this is a little dated. They've grown since then. But the structure of how these ads works, uh, or sorry, the, the structure of the rate card will show you these ads in uh, practice. So they have basically 
If we ignore the takeover column, they have three different ads. They have their what they call their primary, their secondary, and then bruise bets. And that is your premium, downsell, and loss leader. So primary uh, for their daily email was $31,000. The secondary or the downsell, $20,000, right? So about fifth, what is that? Uh, Two thirds the price. And then the bruise bets, which are, if you've read the brew, bruise bets are like literally just one sentence, very similar to what he's offering in the for the interested newsletter. Those cost $10,000 a pop. Now, how does this work? Okay, your ad seller walks into the room, the sales call, you know, they make sure the client's a good fit and they're, you know, going to benefit from running the ad. It comes time to talk about pricing and they come right out of the gate with that 31000 And one or two things is going to happen then. The client is either going to say, okay, great. Or they're going to say, ooh, like that's a little high for me. And that's where you have this opportunity to leverage those other two pieces of ad inventory to get the sale done. So you can either say, well, hey, great. Totally get it. We also have this $20,000 option that might feel better. Or they can do this. They can say, if it really feels like it's going to be a stretch, right? They could say, well, hey, Bruce Betts is a third of the price. You'll still get attention in the newsletter. You can use this as a test. And then you can see if it's worth investing more here. Or they can say, okay, I get it. 31 is like right on the edge of what you're comfortable with. Why don't we throw in a Bruce Betts as well? And then they've just given the client $10,000 in value for literally like, practically no effort, right? Because mm. the bet is just a 10 word sentence with a link in it, uh, which by the way, you could definitely sell the way he's selling these. Like you could sell that type totally of ad could. just like this. Yeah. That's kind of the behind the scenes on how ad inventory works and, and how to think about whether or not to add it. Now, there's one last thing people can consider when growing inventory. Uh, and by the way, the way that these grow is over time. So Certainly. yeah, I mentioned you can build a huge business with just one ad placement. Uh, you do not need to dive in with three different types of ad inventory if you haven't monetized ads at all yet. But over several years, this is kind of the progression that your business will typically go through. And then there's another step, which is called list segmentation. And that's where currently, you know, if he sells an ad spot in the list, I'm assuming I could be wrong about this, but it the ad probably goes to the entire list. So it's 200 bucks, you get to his entire mailing list. List segmentation, basically what's going to happen is your list is going to get so big that at a certain point, no normal advertiser could afford to reach your entire list for the type of feedback they're going to get, right? Like they just, the, the numbers just don't work. So what you do is this thing called list segmentation where instead of selling an ad to your entire list, like let's say it costs... Like, let's say your CPM is 40 bucks, right? So I'm scrolling down to show just like a little example right here. If your typical ad sells for $40, what list segmentation is, is you can break your list into three different segments and then sell ads to each of those segments for, say, $15 a piece, right? So that if you sell all three ads, rather than earning 40 for selling to the entire list, you're now earning 45. But each of your advertisers is paying like a more reasonable rate. The challenge there, like the, the reason list segmentation is challenging is because with each of these progressively more complex models, you need more people in order to pull it off. Managing, so it's got to work yeah. from a business standpoint. I'm jacked up. First off, I need to laugh one more time about how you said because every day Tim's always texting me about I got the coolest shit. I got the coolest <laughs> shit. And so I'll be more mindful of that next time. But <laughs> well, this it yeah, it you like I said, this delivers. I was sitting there wondering, I'm like, what's it gonna be? It's always a mystery. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this time really flew by. And so I guess to wrap this up, there's something that I want to bring to the attention of everybody. And that is it's very easy to look at these things from creator brands, right? And, and I suppose that is something that has held me back because I, I just never wanted to be in the business of making content to talk about other content, you know, and like 10 ways to use LinkedIn and, and sell LinkedIn courses. I just, 
So there's anything wrong with it. It just didn't appeal to me. I always thought like, let me use my content to build my companies and not necessarily create like a content flywheel type model. And so I, I think I have been surrounded in that echo chamber of all of the people that I learned from and talked to are in this space. But when I saw this model, And how he sends out these daily short little emails. The first thing I thought of is all the different industries that this would apply to. And so this is a topic that comes up a lot in this podcast. And every time it does, I I want to continue to hit home on it, right? Because right away, I thought, man, fitness would be so good for this because there's so much fitness content out there. And so like every day you find a great tweet or you find a great like fitness uh video on Instagram about like how to do form, you know, you send out like an email that takes you honestly four minutes to write. And then if you build up uh, uh, an audience, you can sell sponsorship. I was thinking about, uh, I mean, anything, right? I think the opportunity here is not to get bogged down in creating another brand about brand building, but creating a brand about something else that you're interested in. And then finding out very, very, very quickly, I think, that there's the same attention arbitrage game in every industry in the world that there is within like the creator content creation industry. And so I think there's like more opportunity out there for the industries and um, communities, let's call them, that we don't have like the most exposure to. So anybody listening to this, it's like into gardening or that's into carpentry or like we use birds. You know what I mean? Like, hell yeah. Like I'm ready to build a newsletter about bird watching right now and sell sponsored <laughs> links. Like I just really, I know that I'm laughing about this, but I never thought that there was a way to streamline the managerial process of ad sales, which was always the part that seemed like so stupid to me. I was like, why would anybody do that? Because you could take all of that time to build an actual business that like you got to spend the time anyway. You're not saving any time, you know, but with seeing this and how streamlined it can become, I'm I'm not ready to say I'm a believer, but I'm I'm a little bit closer than I was last week. Yeah, I think this is very cool. There's there are some there are still some logistical challenges in this. I would be curious to know like how much what? of his week. So uh one, I would suspect there's probably a price limit under which people would be comfortable going through a process like this. Sure. Go hit a ceiling. And yeah, even it like so even in your situation, you know, it started with personal outreach. So he's still fielding some level of personal outreach in order to get this done, which makes sense. That's how ad sales are typically done. But I'd be curious to know what that is. At some point, people are going to want to be like, I, I don't think I could sell a $30,000 ad using this model. I could be wrong, though. And, you know, looking at Morning Brew's team, they actually built a very, they custom built a tool to help streamline that, that back and forth wow. because there is quite a lot of it. I think some of the other things that are typically involved. So the ad sale process kind of breaks down into three steps. There's sales, account management, and like copywriting and inst- yeah. that account management piece is the most is the trickiest one. Well, actually, I should say I probably should have paused on this in the beginning, but you 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 made a good point of this. The voice of the ad matters a lot. Yeah. It, the the rule at the hustle was always when the reader wins, like when your audience comes first, everybody wins. You know, the reality is that sometimes it's tough to convince advertisers of that. So they're going to come in the door, they want to say their thing. But you know your audience and you're going to be like, well, this, like, they'll send you an ad and you'd be like, this copy sucks. It's not going to work. You would never say that directly like that, or maybe you would. But the reality is there is still back and forth, even in a situation like this. I think if you are able to streamline it, it's, it's probably because of the low price point. And at a certain point, uh, that's going to break down. He's going to have to start bringing people into this because you have salespeople who are going to help bring clients in the door with that high price point. You have account managers that have to go back and forth with the uh, with the clients for assets. Your copywriters know your voice, know your audience, and they have to kind of sell their approach to the ad to your clients. 
And then there's a whole like reporting side of this as well, where you're oh, yeah. telling the client how the ad performance, stuff like that. So I think this is great for uh, just starting out. And I would bet, I don't know, how how expensive would you be willing to buy? I'd, I'd go like all the way up to 500 bucks for something like this. I was thinking that same exact thing when you said the limit. Like, yeah, that is true. When I, I'm not going to spend $20,000 it's not that I wouldn't spend $20,000 on an ad. It's like, I am definitely ACHing that. Like I'm not just swiping my debit card through it. <laughs> and I think that is one of the things about the ad business that once it gets so big to where you really make money, like the bigness within itself becomes a challenge that you also need to navigate around. Right? So this is really cool and flexible and like scrappy. I think he could probably keep going until at least got like a hundred thousand subscribers. I, I think you could swipe a credit card for ah, five hundred bucks, you know, may, like maybe a thousand. If your ad is killing it to the point where it just has like a reputation, you know, and yeah. you have a track record where people trust you and they know that it's going to be fine. I, I think you could probably do a thousand bucks on a credit card, but but absolutely, I never thought about that potential downside where um, just logistically there's different processes involved when you get big so that's a yeah. challenge but either way I'm, I'm i'm still hype on this well totally yeah this buzz. is a great this is a great way to step into that world i've never seen this execution before it's super creative and yeah. i think this is a great way for like a one-man team to make this business model work and then like the beauty of it is let's say we're right and there's a limit to how much people are willing to spend right it's going to be, it's definitely higher than 200. He knows that it's, let's say it's 500. So that's, you know, two and a half times what he's making now. Well, at 500, that's, you know, $10,000 a month uh, product. Now you have money to start bringing in some freelancers who can help with some of that back and forth. So yeah. the the solution is still good enough to get the ball rolling. And then as it's get, like, if your biggest problem is that people are cutting you checks that are too <laughs> yeah. big to handle this way, like that's a good problem to have, <laughs> you know? Right. It's like, yeah. hey, Josh, how was your week? It's like, oh, you're never going to believe it. I have to charge <laughs> too much money. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. This was good. I stumbled across this article that I love and it's, I loved it because the, it's about somebody who made money using a creator model, more than $100,000 a year, uh, using sort of like a Patreon model. And what I love about it is I think a lot of people execute on that wrong. And I think this person solved it. So the guy's name is Caleb Portio. Are you familiar with him? No. Can you send me the link? Sure. This is uh, the story is from a couple years back, but the lesson is timeless. So I'm going to share it here. And the, what he did, he's a developer. He's a software developer. He was basically making like eighty or ninety thousand dollars a year at his job, and then he just he saved up some money and decided to go on like a sabbatical. And while he was on sabbatical, he fell in love with this new framework. So he started making uh, open source software, and and like I said, he ended up generating more than a hundred thousand dollars a year through GitHub's sponsor program. So GitHub now has basically the equivalent of a Patreon model, where if you see software developers building things that you like. Even if they're not charging for them, you can sign up to you can sign up to support them for like X number of dollars a month. And he used that, ended up generating a six figure income. And I think the way he did it is really smart. Here's what he did: you can think of his success as breaking into basically three different phases, from zero to about seven thousand dollars. He did what most people do, which is rely on like really nice people to support him because they like him. And I think I see media entrepreneurs doing this wrong all the time. This is the same thing people do. They'll say. Sign up for my Substack, and like, if you pay an extra twenty bucks a month, you become a supporter, and like, you get whatever, maybe an extra um, Substack. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sign up, sign up if you want to support, or maybe they'll throw in one more email. And the reality is that's just not going to work. What you're really doing there is you're kind of relying on charity, right? Because people like you, so they're supporting you, but nobody really wants like more of the same thing for money. Right, they'll they'll pay for something different, but they won't pay for more of the same for long. So this is something that I think a lot of Substack type people struggle with. He got up to about seven thousand dollars, and then sales sort of tapered off. Then he had an insight where he was developing this product. A lot of people wanted it. He was going to make it open source because he's an open source code kind of guy, which means for anybody who's not like a coder, it was going to be free for the world to use and adapt however they liked. Yeah. And he and a friend struck on an idea where they said. 
no, no, I'm not going to make this open source yet. Here's what we're going to do. They call it sponsorware. We are going, this is going to be only available to sponsors until I hit, say, 100 sponsors, right? Each paying 25 bucks a month. Once we hit that level, I'll open source it. He called it sponsorware. They kind of hashed this idea out on his podcast and it worked like crazy. It grew his revenue in, I think it was two days to 17,000, from seven to 17,000. So he almost tripled his revenue in like two days just by creating this better incentive. And then that same model took him all the way up to $29,000 in about three months. So that incentive worked well. Now here's the third big unlock. He released that piece of software, eventually hit the point where he had enough sponsors to open source it. So now anybody can use it, right? Because his sponsors piled on in order to make sure that it was available. In order to get to the next level, what he did was he started releasing sponsor-only content. And specifically what he did was he had some tutorials on how to use the software, and they were all free. And then he, as he added new features, he would add new tutorials, but they were behind the paywall. So in order to see how to use like this new feature or to do this new thing with the software, you had to jump in and be a sponsor. And that grew him from that $29,000 mark up over $100,000 in three more months. So between like January and June or so of this year of of 2020, when he was building this, he grew from like nothing to over a hundred thousand dollars in recurring rev or yeah, annual revenue. So more than what is that? $9,000 a month through smart incentivization. And I love this concept because I think it leverages this really well, but what I wanted to do to make this like helpful is break it down and make it just a universal model. So what did he really do here? But I'll, I'll, before I do that, I'll pause. What's your take on this? I think it's brilliant. I, I guess my brain thinking right away where what is premium content that can be viewed as premium, not through like a paywall, but just through sponsorships. Mm -hmm. Let me keep, keep thinking about that because I thought about this a lot at first. I'm like, well, how could you do this? Maybe if you're building a class or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Here's where I ultimately landed. This is this is what he really did. If you want to abstract, and I think this would work across industries, and it would work even better in like niche industries because this relies on sponsorship. Mm-hmm. So not a huge fan base, right? Okay. Here's what he did. First, you have a product that does something useful that people want to use, right? So it's not really like having a course or something like that. It's more like a piece of software you built, or but this could be this could be something else. It could be like Canva templates that you're using to create social media content. It could be spreadsheets that you use to analyze deals in your company or to do like to do something functional in your field. Or it could be like a Notion doc that you use in order uh, on a regular basis in order to get something done. Something useful that you've developed. And the thought process that I love here, I forget where I saw this. It was a tweet, but somebody said something to the effect of like, everybody's got an extra ten to twenty thousand dollars a month sitting on their Google Drive. If you just go through and look at the documents that you use on a regular basis, what can you templatize and turn into a product? That's step one: product that people want. Right? You yeah. paywall that, and rather than selling it one off, you only make it available to monthly sponsors using something like Patreon. Or if you're like, you know, there's a like uh, WooCommerce can help do this, can help yeah. make this possible. All types of stuff. Yeah. Then once you hit a certain threshold of sponsorship, that asset now becomes open to the world, right? So you're no longer selling access to it. It's, it's just out there for people to use and you release documentation alongside it. And then a portion of the documentation, like whether you're, maybe you create new documentation each month in order to show how to do a new thing. Or maybe you're adding features each month and you're talking about how to do that. The new documentation becomes that sponsor only screencast. And that's what you use to continue to push people into your sponsorship sort of fold. Otherwise, just having the product out there, it's almost like the early group where you, when you keep that product behind a paywall until you hit a certain level, that early group is really subsidizing the production of whatever this thing is. And then once you hit a certain level, it's more about getting people excited about learning how to use it. So they now anybody can use it, but if you really want to be good at it, you gotta be in the club. And then you just keep releasing new documentation and new features. And that becomes kind of the product update cycle. 
So I think that could work across industries. I, I don't really think that's limited to just software, but I love that model. And I, what I really like about it is that he's thinking about the incentive structure well. The incentive structure is definitely important. And it's like the opposite of content marketing because content marketing, at least traditionally from like a, a semantical point of view, is you have a product and then you use the content content to sell the product. But this is kind of like you're using the product to sell the content. And then the Ooh. leverage is in the content because people need the content to figure out how to use the product in the first place. So like the incentive to read the content is already there because the product is free. It's like I, I, I've been on this kick the last, well, I shouldn't say a kick, the last three years as I've been growing as an entrepreneur, especially now that Stadzi has you know, really got like a lot of employees and stuff like that. I think about incentives a lot. And there's this Charlie Munger quote, which I, I might have talked about before, but it's, uh, if you want ants, then lay sugar, right? Like everything in the universe can be determined by reward. And so the incentive structure is so clear here because the incentive for attention is in the free product. Like who gets to use free products anymore? Like Canva is the only one I can really think of, right? And even... Even then, there's a limit on it, which is is fine though. Like you can use Canva forever, the free version, and be totally fine, right? But there's been many, many times where I was like, "How the hell do I do this?" And then you got to look at the docs on it. And so it's like it's content marketing, but exactly the opposite. It's like product marketing. So using the product to leverage the attention on the thing that what actually works, and then of course who's incentivized to get in front of people reading those documents, like other companies within that really specific niche community of whatever it is that your product is operating in. So I, I get it, man. Like it's abstract for sure. It's interesting that he thought of it this way. He probably just stumbled upon it by accident, you know, like, okay, I guess I'll do this next, but it's, yeah, you can it's literally really listen. working. You can literally listen to the podcast where they like dream this model up really together. Him and his, yeah, him and his co-host. And they were just joking around and all of a sudden they kind of stumble closer and closer to this idea. And I think it's a good one. I'm a little bit uh, torn on how I would feel as a consumer knowing that I was helping me too. to make something free by paying for it. Yeah, But there, yeah, there are certain cultures where that definitely is a thing. Like, I mean, he's a coder, so coding is definitely one of them. And I think there are other niches where that could be a thing too. Like the one that comes to mind would be like women in entrepreneurship, right? There's a, like a really strong solidarity there. and. I think a lot of people trying to make sure that other people have opportunities that they didn't necessarily have. So if you're uh, like a woman putting out information for female entrepreneurs and you're looking for a way to like monetize that, I think one very legitimate option would be to reach out as effectively to the more successful members of your community and say, hey, I want to make this thing available to everybody, but it's got to pay the bills. And so here's how I want to do this. Uh, like who wants to basically who wants to be part of making this available to the broader community? I think there's a way to do that. And then, yeah. lastly, to your point, the higher tier monetization where you're where you're putting information behind a paywall is also a little bit complex because you don't want to piss off the users, right? Like where it's like totally. oh, I can't do anything without paying. So there's a line that you have to tread there in order to make sure that what you're putting behind a paywall is uh, like worth paying for. It's, there's a psychology thing. But also you said something, which is like other companies in the space who are using this. I think there's a lot of people, I don't know, I haven't seen his numbers, but I would guess that a like a decent percentage of the types of people who would pay for access to just unlock a library, probably going to be companies whose employees are using whatever product sure. you're talking about. And they're just like, I don't even care how much it costs. Just uh, just make sure that my people can do whatever they need to do with this product. And if it's an extra hundred bucks a year or whatever to have access to the content library, that's fine. So that's What's something to name? as well. Uh, his name is Caleb Portio. And uh, he's on Twitter. We'll just shout him out real quick. It's fine. This guy. I want to talk. I want to learn more from him. He's really interesting. He's got like classes out there now. Oh, I should. There's one other thing that I pulled up when I was looking at all this information because it's easy to look at models like this and assume that it would just work out of the gate. But even his model is not immune to uh, the 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 rules that we've laid out many times on this show, which is that if you want to make like a successful run at a business like this, there's three steps. The first step 
is your cash flow. Second step is your audience. Third step is products. What we're talking about here is monetizing that third step in a really creative way. But I went and I looked. So I wanted to see how big his audience was when he did this. So I plugged his, by the way, you can do this if you're interested, if you're a nerd like me, take his Twitter page, plug it into the Wayback Machine on archive.org. And at the time, he had about 15,000 Twitter followers back when this was happening in 2020. Now he's up to like 30,000. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other is that he had a podcast. But you know, for anybody yeah. who's considering this, 15,000 is not unreachable. Like if you, if you put your head down and, 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 and work hard. But he did have the audience before he started this. And so you're not going not gonna to break the physics of like product success. Hey, cash flow, distribution, sales. Like... That's how it is. I like that. <laughs> like, we need to remind people every single week cash flow, distribution, sales. If you got an idea, it don't matter if you got no cash flow. If you got money, it doesn't necessarily matter unless you got attention. And if you have both of those things, then you still need to have something worth selling. So, uh, so that's really cool. All right, man. I got to wrap this one up. But yep. uh, this was always a pleasure. This was my favorite episode yet. I, I think we're really hitting our groove. And, um, and I had so much fun. I want to learn more about Caleb, though. I'm going to reach out to this guy on Twitter as well because I love making friends. <laughs> All the links are All going right. to be in the show notes. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for the kind words. Got even more DMs this this weekend on Twitter for people listening to the podcast. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, please leave us a review. Really, we don't have ads on this show. We're not selling you anything the best thing you can do to support the show is to leave us a review especially on apple which just really helps with the algorithm all right we'll talk to you next week